So Music Void, we're back here and we have Ted Cohen, who's the managing partner of Tag Strategic here. If you can just give us a very brief, quick introduction of what Tag Strategic is, what it does, that'd be great. Okay, well, uh, Tag Strategic was started about two and a half years ago after I left EMI, where I was uh, doing digital business development for about six years. And the idea was that I felt there was a void, no pun intended, between uh, being able to translate between what the label's aspirations were for digital and music and what uh, service providers and technology creators and innovators were trying to do with music that they were talking across each other. And I really felt there was an opportunity to bridge that gap and uh, try and basically provide some universal translation that, you know, the technologies weren't trying to rip the labels off and the labels hopefully weren't trying to be overreaching in uh, their aspirations to uh, share in, in the success of, uh, you know, innovative startups, okay. if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it does. And so, going, going back, looking back at 2008, what are some of the key technologies you saw that, whether they were music specific or not, or gadget specific or apps. Well, there's all that, kinds, but I mean, yeah, I, no, the, I think key, the, the biggest ones that you think are going to have the biggest impact on your own personal oppression, if you can state that. I think, well, I mean, 2008 seemed to be the arrival of uh, ad supported music, mm -hmm. where labels got over the issue of was music free, per being perceived as free. And so sites such as Last FM and iMeme and iLike and others were providing music to fans for free but they were being paid for through advertising re revenue shares. So that business model, I think, was interesting. The business model that had the most problem in 2008 were the playlist uh, type sites, whether it was SeekPod or Muxtape or Mixwit or Project Playlist, Playlist.com. Uh, the labels were really having a problem with uh, search engine results. And so if you look at that model where you're going out and you're finding music that is existing on the net and putting that together into a playlist for a fan, is that inherently, um, you know, is that illegal? We don't know. I think that the labels need to get over, and really, and I, and I spent most of my life working at music companies and I understand their needs and their viewpoint and their aspirations, but it's not about controlling it anymore, and it's not about litigating it, and it's not about takedown notices. It's about monetizing behavior. We've talked about the technology store in 2008. Where do you see the industry um, moving over the next couple of years, its transition and um, acceptance uh, with both the people that's been in conflict with? Right. How do you, whether that be ISPs, whether it be these new playlist uh, things, do you see that self resolving itself and if so in what sort of time frame roughly well i see them letting go of i mean i have been even before i left emi in in april of 2006 i was speaking in hong kong at, an, at the launch of the n series of nokia phones and i addressed that i be believed that the future of music as a product was dead and it was all about music as a service and i think it's becoming really evident that that's where we're going um, I don't think people are going to pay a per unit cost for music going forward. There will be people that will still buy, but I think it's going to be marginalized. So we're seeing with the advent of these ideas of licensing ISPs, comes with music from Nokia, music station from Omniphone, we're seeing this eventuality playing itself out that people will get an unlimited supply of music and they will pay for music, but it won't be based on a per unit cost. So I think 2009 is going to be where these services start to really become mainstream. Okay, and what are your thoughts on the like interoperability issues? Like if you have an iPod, just sort of tied into their format, or you can obviously change it, but it's a bit of a pain in the ass if right. you don't buy the. MP3. Although they've just gone all well, MP3. Well, they just went. They all went MP3. But the problem that people don't realize with Apple is even though they went, they didn't go MP3. They went non-DRM, so it's still AAC. You can convert it to MP3 if you want to, but it, they've still left a little bit of a hiccup in there. But I think interoperability is getting more and more uh, a reality and less of an idealistic uh, situation. We could have solved it 
five years ago if Apple would have cooperated and made Fair Play interoperable with Windows Media. Microsoft was willing to do it. Apple wasn't. Yeah. So this added five years to consumers' frustration, but we're getting there now, so it's water under the bridge. And what do you think, you know, there's the Google phone, the G1, and the tie-up with Have Amazon. The tie-up with Amazon and sort of the Amazon MP3, that sort of the synergies between that. Where do you see that going in the next I think Amazon, Amazon has shown that if you know your customer, your customer will continue to come back. And I think that Amazon, again, I'm not dumping on Apple, but I think Amazon has done a much better job of serving their customer than Apple has done. Apple has a great, there's, there's an ethos about Apple where people just love Apple products. I could, you know, if I showed you a Blackberry and it had an Apple logo on it, you'd say, wow, that's fantastic. Then if I showed you it was a Blackberry, you go, it's okay, but geez, I really wish it was, you know, from Apple. So they've done a great job of building the brand, but in reality, Amazon's done a better job of serving their customers. So I think it's going to be much more of a competitive environment than people believe. When you look at Apple currently having an 80% market share, that's not insurmountable for other players like Amazon and other services to, you know, to level that playing field. And on one final question, which is, well, the, the indies feel like they've had that backs up against the wall with different levels of payment levels between them and the majors when they're dealing with some of the big machines, whether it be MySpace Music. MySpace Music is not the only one. There's, there's YouTube, there's others. Um, do you see that issue resolving itself in the near future? I'm I said in my opening remarks yesterday, that was one of the things I was concerned about when we had the opening uh, of MediumNet yesterday that the lack of parity between the indies and the majors is something that has to be addressed. I think the voice of the independent label and the independent artist is getting stronger. And I think there's going to be, again, a leveling of that playing field. I mean, uh, digital technology has, has a, an ability to level the players a bit. The thing that comes out of that leveling, though, is, is it's going to take curation of all this music. I talked yesterday also about the fact that I think recommendation engines, uh, personalization, recommendation, and really great discovery tools, once we have this unlimited access to millions, literally millions of songs, and you know hundreds of thousands of artists, how do you navigate that? So I think the real business opportunity is for the recommendation engines, whether it be Pandora or Echo Nest or Sentinetic or the Filter or, I mean, there's uh, One Llama. I'll try and get all of them in there. Music IP, music intelligence. These guys, I think, can be the winners because I will pay for somebody to help me manage my access to music. Yeah. Is it, there you have it from Ted Cohen. The uh, Mr. Genius who sort of thought forward thinker who began many, many years ago. 26 years, but who's counting? Thank you very much. Thank you. We wish you a very fruitful 2009.